People in the supermarket are in touch with their deepest emotions. In times of depression, recession, the shopper is wondering if her money will continue. If she will have any to spend the next time she pushes a cart. In times of boom and inflation, she wonders if next time there will be anything she can afford. In recent times, this last worry has been the worst. It's the special terror of the person whose days of work are over, whose income for the rest of life is given, will never increase. What happens if that money ceases to sustain life or accustomed respectability? What will happen to me, to us? The emotions generated by money are not all marked with grief. They're remarkably diverse and unparalleled in their antiquity. Money! There are few ways in which a man may be more innocently employed than getting money. Dr. Samuel Johnson. Wine make us merry, but money answereth all things. Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verse 13. The history of money is the history of at least 2,000 years of inflation. Paul Anzi, British economist. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Money Fair. <laughs> Money buys access to all parts of the human carnival, all the booths of the fair. It is a singular thing. It ranks with love as man's greatest source of joy, and with death as his greatest source of anxiety. Money differs from an automobile, a mistress, or cancer, in being equally important to those who have it and those who don't. The carnival metaphor, the exciting ride on which money takes those who possess or pursue it, is a very old one in the literature of finance. The reality is a bit more grim. Over all of history, money has oppressed people in one of two ways. Either it has been very abundant and very unreliable, or it has been reliable and very, very scarce. But for many people today, it has a third fault. It is both unreliable and scarce. These are the anxieties that haunt the woman in the supermarket. We understand them and all the diverse emotional power of money if we look at its history the best avenue to its understanding. Over the centuries, money has had a wonderful capacity for taking people on a kind of carnival ride. Sometimes, as I've said, it's been abundant and unreliable, sometimes reliable and very hard to get. The carnival metaphor emerges from what money has done to people and also from the superb gallery of innovative rogues, rascals, and quite honest men who made its history. John Law, a fugitive Scot in Paris who showed how a bank could engineer a truly colossal boom and bust. William Patterson, another lowland Scot who originated the most prestigious of all monetary institutions, the Bank of England. Alexander Hamilton, who gave the new American Republic a stable currency, tried unsuccessfully to give it to Bank of England. Nicholas Biddle, who took up the battle to give the United States a central bank and lost. Mr. Bernard Kornfeld, who raised the hope of having money without work to new heights in our own time. All went from great innovation to great disaster. Law, Patterson, and Biddle all went broke. Alexander Hamilton was shot. Bernie Kornfeld had problems. The first service of money is to avoid the inconvenience of barter, the problem in the direct exchange of butter for horses or a house. Many things, seashells, cattle, whiskey, have been used. For two centuries, Virginia and Maryland used tobacco, and in Virginia, nothing else has so far served as money for so long. Before Wolf and Moncon, French Canada had the most exotic currency of all, playing cards. All critics of speculation must weep, but they're gone. Las Vegas and Wall Street used the same currency, clubs and diamonds. Gambling on the stock exchange would not be a figure of speech. Also, Barclays bank statements and hearts, diamonds and spades would be a joy to read. Metals, gold, silver, copper were the commodities most often used. Weighing chunks of metal was a nuisance. Coinage, pieces of metal of specified weight, eliminated that need for weighing. The ruler's head was stamped on coins to inspire confidence, or so it was said. John Maynard Keynes held that more often it was a thoughtful personal gesture by the ruler to himself. The singular feature of every monetary invention is the resulting search for ways and means to its abuse. After coins were invented, rulers and private entrepreneurs joined alike in clipping, sweating, or otherwise debasing them. 
The idea was to keep some of the precious metal and make a worse coin do the same work. This had great consequences to which I'll come in a moment. Coins, we might know, they're now largely obsolete. They're used only as minor change for occasional nervous hoarding as collector's items, and most important of all for slot machines. After coinage, the next great invention was the manufacture of money by a bank. This was wonderful, true magic, and so it still seems. It gave bankers much prestige and required that they have great solemnity of manner. No one wants a funny man with a real license to manufacture money. The last great step was government paper money. This in the West was the invention of the British colonies in North America. Coins, banks, government paper required another invention, the central bank, something to regulate the manufacture of all this money. These are early pictures of the Bank of England. Historians agree that almost everything we know about central banking was learned here by the Bank of England. Tales from the history of money. Ladies and gentlemen, the historical tableau. Number one, 1609. The Bank of Amsterdam. A critical step in the history of money was taken here in the city of Amsterdam in the early 17th century. By 1600, hard coin money was abundant in Amsterdam as also throughout Europe. Silver and gold had been flowing into Europe from the New World. Mostly it was silver, and mostly it had been mined by very hard toil by the Indians. Silver at the beginning of the 17th century, the time we're talking about, had become especially plentiful. This flow is demonstrating the most elementary proposition regarding money. The more abundant the money, everything else equal, the less it will buy. Because money was abundant, prices everywhere in Europe were rising. A good many people hadn't heard about the discovery of America in these years, but everyone in Europe was seeing its effects in whatever trifle they had to buy. However prestigious and upright the trading community, there was still that irresistible urge to tamper with the money, to sweat and clip the coins and make less metal do the work of more. The range and variety and quality of the coin available in Amsterdam was appalling. In 1606, the Dutch Parliament issued a manual for money changers. It listed no fewer than 846 different coins as being then in circulation. No one could now be certain, when he received a coin, what he was getting. It was to this problem of quality that the burghers of Amsterdam then addressed themselves. They created a bank, owned by the city, and the bank solved the problem of the quality of coins by going back to weighing, to decide how much metal of what purity was in the coins. In doing this, the town fathers pioneered the idea of public regulation of the money supply by a public bank. A merchant brought his wretched coins to the bank. The bank weighed them, scales like this. The deposit of the pure metal was then made to the merchant's account in the bank. This deposit was a highly reliable form of money. A merchant could transfer it to another merchant. The recipient knew that he was getting honest weight but there was nothing funny. Then came the second discovery. The deposits that were so created did not need to be left idly in the bank. They could be lent. The bank then got interest, and the borrower had a deposit to his account that he could spend. But the original deposit still stood to the credit of the original depositor, and that too could be spent. No one should rub his or her eyes in amazement money, spendable money, had been created. Something that's still being done every day. And creation of money by a bank is as simple as that. The important thing is that the original depositor and the borrower must not come at the same time for their deposits, for their money. They must trust their bank. They must, in a sense, believe that the bank isn't doing what it is doing. The Dutch merchants have always been skilled in getting money and learned in its use. And after 1600, they used it to build one of the most beautiful cities of Europe and to support the arts. After Rembrandt moved here in 1631 to join the many artists who had preceded him, Amsterdam had a clear claim to be considered the center of the whole art world.
patronage of the arts, painting, architecture, urban design, proved that a family deserved the money that it possessed. It would be nice to attribute this prosperity and this flowering of the artistic spirit all to the Bank of Amsterdam. Bankers would applaud, and Chase Manhattan might even sponsor me on television. But as might be imagined, other factors were involved. Amsterdam was admirably situated on one of the outlets of the Rhine. It was also a tolerant place. Men who wanted to make money could do business here regardless of race, creed, or origin. And much of its prosperity was made by its Huguenots and Portuguese and Spanish Jews. This elegant house, by the way, is still owned by the Six family. Uh, the Six family were Huguenots by origin. Rembrandt was a friend of the family. His name still appears in an early guest book. And one of his great portraits, that of the first John Six, is still in this house. I said earlier that any monetary reform carries the seeds of its own abuse. So it was with the Bank of Amsterdam. One of the important borrowers from the bank was the Dutch East India Company. And in time, the East India Company fell on hard times. There was war with England, the ships did not come back, and loans went into default. Early in the last century, the depositors started coming to the Bank of Amsterdam for their money, and they couldn't be paid. And so it came about that in 1819, after two centuries of service, the affairs of the bank had to be wound up. By then, however, there was a much more spectacular example of how a bank could abuse the creation of money. The history now moves to Paris, more elegant, more theatrical, although not more beautiful than Amsterdam. Louis XIV, having lived too long, was now dead. His heir was only a boy. The realm had great debts and little money. The regent was incompetent, intellectually as well as financially bankrupt. Such men in such straits are open to persuasion, any promise of magic. What was needed was some magician who could transform the regent's debts into assets, or perform some similar feat of ledger domain. As it happens, a very accomplished rascal was available. So accomplished that some historians regret the word rascal. His name was John Law. These are his rooms in Paris. Law was the son of a well-to-do Edinburgh goldsmith, who was also a banker. Goldsmiths in those days were often bankers because they had good strong boxes. He had come to Paris a few years before, not wholly by his own choice. He was wanted in England on a murder rap. He'd been unduly successful in a duel. In addition to dueling, he was an accomplished gambler. He was said to have met the regent in a gambling hall. And he had a genuinely innovative mind in other fields of finance. In 1716, Law got permission from the regent to establish a bank, the Bank Royale. This then took over the debts of the regent and those of the realm. These debts were then paid off with notes of the bank. This considerable endowment served Law's purposes in two ways. The notes that his bank were issuing were backed in principle by gold and silver. The needs of the regent being large, the note issue was also very large. By no stretch of the imagination was there enough gold and silver in France uh, to redeem the notes. So the imagination was stretched to include Louisiana. Where it was held, the gold and silver were available in unlimited supply, mountains of precious metals. The reality was wonderful in its way. Forests, swampland, rich farmland, great rivers, but unfortunately, no gold. John Law was not deterred. He organized a company to conduct trade with this territory, the Company of the West, known ever since as the Mississippi Company. And the company held absolute title to all land from the Gulf of Mexico to Canada, from the Rockies east to the Alleghenies. An excellent piece of real estate. And the regent made John Law the titular lord of this manor, the first and only Duke de Arkansas. The year 1719 was a truly wonderful time. Law's notes went out by the hundreds of millions to pay the regent's debts. People paid off in the notes, rushed to buy stock in the Bank Royale, the wonderful machine that was making the money, or in the Mississippi Company that was thought to be mining the gold. 
The stocks went up and up. It's to this year that we owe the useful French word millionaire. Crowds also swarmed here to the Place Vendôme, the law's headquarters. Some hoped to catch a glimpse of him. Some, on one pretext or another, hoped to get inside. Those who got inside asked law to sell them stock. Women investors, well, the histories tell us with much pleasure, offered themselves as an added inducement. This must have been an interesting experience for someone from Scotland. Anyhow, it would have been an interesting experience for anyone from the part of Scottish Canada that I came from. If there were occasional doubts, there were also means of dispelling them. Criminals and mendicants were flushed out of their accustomed haunts, marched through the streets with shovels, as though on the way to New Orleans to mine gold. And some actually went. Quite a few were soon seen in Paris again, having sold their shovels. Ladies of medium virtue, as literally they were called, were also recruited as wives. It had seemed a perfect circle. Law's notes going out to pay the regent's debts, coming back to buy the stock. But there came a day in 1720 when serious doubts developed. People brought their notes not to buy stock, but to the bank royale for the gold and silver that were not there. The gold and silver that by the nature of banking, and this bank especially, were not there. The rush to get hard money became a panic. The notes became worthless. The rue Cancampois, where Law had started the bank, was quiet again. It was a classic crash, the classic crash. For a while, people had felt rich. And prices being good and trade lively, to some extent, they had been. Now everyone was poor, or so it seemed. What of the Duke de Arkansas? Parisians got what pleasure they could from proposing in a song that his notes be put to the most vulgar possible use. The regent had to protect John Law from the mob, and Law went to Venice, where he died in poverty. The Duke de Saint-Simon, who chronicled Law's adventures, thought he failed because the French lacked restraint. The English would do better. The English did do better. Twenty years before Law's arrival in Paris, a fellow countryman, William Patterson, also from the Scottish Lowlands, had sold essentially the same idea to William of Orange. William, like the regent, needed money. He, too, got it in return for the right of a bank to make loans with newly issued notes. In 1694, out of this bargain, the Bank of England was born. Patterson was soon thrown out, most likely over a conflict of interest. Seems he was promoting a rival bank. But Patterson's bank flourished. Central bankers the world around still bask in its aura. To be a central banker is to be automatically a man of wisdom in touch with the most arcane financial mysteries of the time. This is the legacy of the Bank of England. The men of the bank remain conscious of that legacy. They guard well the original charter and William Seal. The decisions that were taken by the court of directors in this handsome room were not all that mysterious. With a little diligence and attention, they could have been understood by the people who marveled at their wisdom, and they can be understood by you. The Bank of England, then as now, was a banker's bank. As such, it loaned money to the everyday banks, the banks where people keep their money, and the banks where businessmen get their loans. In this role, it restrained the banks, the ordinary banks, when they seemed to be lending too freely. When by the process we saw back in Amsterdam, such loans were creating too many deposits and thus manufacturing too much money, and therefore, <clears throat> among other things, causing prices to go up. The bank restrained such lending by the commercial banks by putting up the interest rate it charged. This was called the bank rate. And it discouraged borrowing by selling the securities it possessed for cash. When it did this, the Bank of England transferred the cash from the strong rooms of the bank to its own vaults. And in consequence, the ordinary banks, the commercial banks, had less money to lend. They might then have to borrow from the Bank of England at the new high rate in order to replenish their cash. In reverse, the same action would expand loans, increase the money supply, cause business to expand, prices to go up or so in any case it was hoped. You now understand the bank rate, what in the United States is called the discount rate, and you understand open market operations, for that is what the sale of those securities and the transfer of cash into the vaults of the central bank really means. And in consequence of understanding these two things, 
you've largely mastered the essentials of central banking as these were perfected here in the Bank of England in the last century. I must mention one more function. In the nature of banking, both the original depositor and the man who borrows and gets a deposit have a claim on the same cash. And if they both come at the same time for that cash, there's obviously going to be trouble, what my offspring used to call a bad scene. And in times of panic and despair, there's a very good chance that they both may come. When this happens, it's the task of the central bank to rise above the panic and above the despair and ensure that the banks have the, <clears throat> have the cash to provide everybody with their money. And here we come to the paradox of banking, that if depositors know they can get their money, they almost never want it. In the last century, the Bank of England came to supply this assurance by supplying the commercial banks, or as in England they are called, the clearing banks, with the money to cover all of the claims that were made upon them, upon them by their depositors. It perfected the further function of the central bank, which is to be, as it's now called, the lender of last resort. <laughs> Victorians raised open market operations, the bank rate, services, the lender of last resort, to the level of art. Men heard with grave attention that the bank rate had been raised or lowered. They didn't know what it meant, but they knew it was an act of extreme wisdom. Wisdom hadn't come as easily as the Victorians supposed. The bank had narrowly escaped involvement in the South Sea bubble, and it was caught up in later periods of speculative euphoria. In these fine cartoons, the bank, the old lady of Threadneedle Street, is under attack for abetting Pitt's inflationary schemes printing paper money. The accusation was in fact sound, but not very practical. It was, it happens, the only way of getting money quickly to fight Napoleon. The bank was captured by the general spirit of the times. It's the old question, who regulates the regulators? Who is the king in a world of the blind when there isn't even a one-eyed man? If central banking belongs to Britain, paper money, government paper money belongs to America. No people have ever rivaled Americans in their faith or delight in monetary experiment. It began in the colonies, and out of this experimental instinct, paper money was born. The birthplace was here in Massachusetts. The year was 1690, four years before the Bank of England was born. Massachusetts soldiers had just returned from a failed campaign against Quebec, where in the same years that playing card money was coming into use. Angry soldiers can be annoying, so they were given notes promising that one day, real money would be paid. As with the early banknotes, the money promised was gold or silver. Rhode Island and South Carolina issued notes in huge volume with no thought of eventual redemption. The middle colonies, Pennsylvania, Maryland, New York, used the new invention with surprising good sense and restraint, found it a great convenience and an antidote to falling prices to press business. Restraint or not, London did not approve. By 1764, Parliament had fully forbidden this dreadful nonsense as they saw it. The action caused almost as much resentment here in Philadelphia as did the taxes. If you're planning a revolution, you should first of all, no doubt, get a cause and a, an army. But then, based on all experience, you should get yourself a printing press. Revolutionary governments cannot easily levy taxes, especially if the revolt is against bad taxes. Their credit isn't likely to be good, so they can't borrow. And there remains only the printing of money. Money so printed paid for the Russian Revolution, likewise for the revolt of the Confederate States, likewise for the French Revolution. The famous assignats were issued against the security of the church lands and the land of the nobility. And 200 years ago, paper money paid for the American Revolution. Some of this money was issued by the states, which is not a surprising thing, since as colonies they had pioneered in this particular invention, and the rest of the Continental Notes were authorized by the Continental Congress. One result, one predictable result, was severe inflation. By the end of the war, a pair of shoes cost about $5,000 in Virginia, and a full outfit came to around a million. But there was no alternative. The colonists, as all know, are greatly opposed to taxation without representation, a principle that was first discussed here in Carpenter's Hall 
in Philadelphia. And also, a very much neglected point, they were almost equally opposed to taxation with representation. No one thought that the new republic was even a passable credit risk, so only one thing remained, paper money. It was paper money that saved the day. This is, on the whole, never been admitted. When the war was over, the sound money men wrote the history, and they could not have it said that the United States had been conceived in financial sin. So they held that the financing of the revolution was a terrible mess without ever explaining what would have been practical as well as right. And their view persists pretty much to this day. The continental note has come down to us only as a symbol of opprobrium. Something is not worth a continental. The historians even edited Benjamin Franklin. He was a powerful advocate of paper money, and he also printed it on his own press. This is scarcely mentioned. Children are told only that Franklin was a great man in diplomacy and thrift and electricity. The paper money served a high function, but no one liked the resulting inflation, and in consequence, the Constitution forbade the states to issue paper money, even as Parliament had done. It also intended to forbid it to the federal government as well, but the Supreme Court amended the Constitution on this point. Banks had also been prohibited by the British. On these, there was now no prohibition. If the government could not print money, the banks could. A man could set up a bank, print notes, make loans in these notes to himself and to his friends. These would buy horses, cattle, machinery, put the borrower in business. A wonderful thing, a bank. The citizens of the new republic discovered banking as an adolescent discovers fornication. The wonder was not shared by the eastern merchants and bankers, to whom the notes came as payments for goods or debts. They wanted money that could be redeemed in gold or silver, held, sent on to England to buy goods. Here were the seeds of the most persistent political conflict in American history, and after slavery, the most bitter. It was between the men who wanted good money and those who wanted the bad money that was so good for putting them in business. The conflict began, actually, with Alexander Hamilton, the first Secretary of the Treasury. He redeemed the Continental notes at the substantial rate of one cent on the dollar, the act of a sound money man. He also established a central bank on the lines of the Bank of England to keep the new state banks in line. It lasted only a few years. The high point of this struggle over good and bad money came in the 1830s. The combatants, Nicholas Biddle, President of the Second Bank of the United States, here, hydra-headed, sinister, Andrew Jackson, President of the United States. Biddle was preeminently a member of the Eastern Establishment, as the Biddles have been ever since. Andrew Jackson spoke for the frontier, Tennessee. Biddle's second bank, like Hamilton's first, was intended to keep the small banks in line. It returned their notes for collection in gold and silver, forced them to keep their note issue in reasonable relation to their hard cash. This limited the right to create the money that for the frontiersmen seemed like magic. And uh, often was. 1832 was the year of the historic showdown. Early that year, the friends of the bank in Congress, led by Henry Clay, renewed the charter of the bank. Jackson came back with a stinging veto. Presidential election was then fought on the issue. Little had the money. Jackson had the votes. The bank was defeated. Money doesn't always win. Power is also a one-time thing. Little very soon went broke himself. The state banks were wonderfully free then for nearly a century. The carnival again. Once Biddle's hand had been lifted, the state banks exploded in number. Almost anyone could open a bank. It became literally a human right. The best documented story is of the backwoods banks of Michigan. This is a story of imaginative fraud and deception, practiced in the main by men who believed they were rendering a public service. And maybe they were. 1825 to 1836. Eighteen new banks are chartered in the new state of Michigan. The Bank of St. Clair, People's Bank of Grand River, the Palmyra and Jacksonburg Railroad Bank, the Goodrich Bank, the Farmer's Bank of Sandstone, the Shiawassee Bank, the Bank of Battle Creek, the Bank of Coldwater, the Farmer's Bank of Sharon. Here in Michigan, as elsewhere, banks were required to maintain a specified reserve of gold and silver against the notes that they had printed and loaned out to their customers. Boxes of coins were sent around through the forest just in front of the commissioners. Here is Commissioner Alpheus Finch. His report, like all such reports, was made after the crash. After people had started coming to the banks to exchange their banknotes for the hard cash, which, by the nature of their operations, was never there. 
And Jackson, nine boxes, said to contain $1,000 each as security, were pulled out from under the counter. Every box had a top layer of half dollars, but the remaining contents proved to be lead, ten penny nails, and in one instance, broken glass. In Oakland County Bank, the vault contained about $40 in specie, against a book account of $41,000. Few can imagine the fear and despondency, the hopes and disappointments, which agitated the community in those days of inflation and speculation. The carnival did finance a truly phenomenal national expansion. The first price was terrible monetary confusion. By 1860, banknote circulation, good, bad, and bogus, was as bad as the coinage in Amsterdam. Notes were then prohibited, but by then, deposits were in any case taking their place. The second price was the cycle of boom and bust. Roll up and ride the business cycle. If it's good enough for him, it should be good enough for you, sir. Perfectly safe. No risk involved. No risk at all. The risk, in fact, was very great. This perilous ride, this cycle of boom and bust, continued through the last century and into the present one. Other countries were taken for the ride, Britain being always the special passenger, but other countries went too. From crash to crash was usually around 20 years, about time for the memory of the last misfortune to fade, the impression that this was a new era to arise. Money creation contributed both to the speculation and to the ensuing collapse. During the boom, the banks, old and new, expanded their loans, note issue and deposits. This money financed the speculation, which was sometimes in canal stock, sometimes in railroad stock, often in land, later in commodities, and in stocks in general. During each boom, doubters were dismissed as men of no imagination. During each depression, politicians denied that anything much was wrong. Financial leaders and professional statesmen said confidence was needed, or they asked for patience, or sometimes they urged prayer. In the panic of 1907, J.P. Morgan, the great Pierpont Morgan, called together the Protestant clergymen of New York and asked them to tell their congregations to leave their money in the banks. His slogan, in God we trust, and damn well also the banks too. The trust was misplaced, especially as regards the small banks. In depression, they failed by the hundreds. The money the people lost could not be spent, and this deepened the depression for everyone. The solution after 85 years was to reverse the Jacksonian victory, create a central bank. It would regulate lending, money creation by the subordinate banks, just as Biddle had attempted. And in 1914, a central bank was established. This was the Federal Reserve System. Here from an early educational film is its view of its task and it's very positive. This few economists have shared. They teach lovingly of its functions, even have an affectionate or slightly repellent nickname, the Fed. Even more positive are the words below the plaque of the patron saint, Senator Carter Glass, at the Washington headquarters. Not merely to correct and cure periodical financial debauches, hard words those, not simply indeed to aid the banking community alone, but to give vision and scope and security to commerce. The reality was perhaps less transcendental. Such were the old suspicions that 12 banks were established instead of one. St. Louis, for example, Philadelphia, New York, with a central authority in Washington, the Federal Reserve Board. The power of the central authority was weak and undefined, and the regional banks wished to assert, where possible, their claim to financial acuity and eminence, to prove that St. Louis, San Francisco, Richmond, was a place of financial consequence. This wish was especially strong here in New York, surely the financial capital. On the whole, until 1935, when Washington authority was affirmed, power was here at the New York Reserve Bank. Until then, it was troublesome, not knowing who was in charge. More serious was an early instinct for doing whatever made economic conditions worse. In the years following World War I, there was serious speculation in commodities and farmland, the great boom of 1919-1920. Federal Reserve, pressed by the Treasury, kept credit easy, provided funds for that speculation. And after the collapse, it tightened up, helped make the resulting depression more painful to all. Then in 1927, as the great stock market boom was getting underway, it eased credit, opened the door to the boom, and thus to the great stock market crash of 1929. The Depression years revealed another defect. 
This and the theory by which a central bank was expected to manage the economy. Slowly, interest rates were lowered, eventually to 1.5% here at the New York Bank. And after some delay, government bonds were bought in the open market, and the banks were made flush with unused cash. All that remained was for borrowers to borrow, banks to lend. And alas, they didn't. Reserves, gold, simply piled up as here in the banks and the reserve banks. The depression was too serious. Why borrow if you couldn't make money? Why lend if the borrower was likely to go broke? And without the willingness of the borrowers to borrow, lenders to lend, the gold reserves lay dead. The Federal Reserve couldn't increase the money supply, stimulate spending, ease the depression. It was helpless. Obviously, something remained to be learned about the management of money. Ooh, the tables down at Maurice, to the place where Louis dwells, to the dear old temple bar. Not many will think that this scene presupposes a serious approach to learning. Strange things happen. Yale University was the home of one of the two greatest modern students of money. With their glasses raised on high. This was Irving Fisher, and Money Keynes called him my earliest teacher. He showed that the study of money doesn't make everyone a conformist. Fisher, a, a neat, slender, handsome man with a patrician manner and a beautifully trimmed beard, was many things. He was a learned mathematician, a successful inventor, a disastrous speculator, and a committed improver of the human race. He invented this simple index system, which he then manufactured himself and later sold it at a handsome price to Remington Rand. In the late 1920s, Fisher went heavily into the stock market. And in the crisis, he lost between eight and $10 million, a sizable sum even for an economics professor. Here in this room and elsewhere in Yale, Fisher pioneered in the development of index numbers. When you read that the consumer's price index has gone up or the cost of living index has gone up, it's Fisher you have ultimately to thank. He pioneered also in mathematical economics. Fisher's greatest contribution, however, was to our understanding of money. He showed in one simple formula what determines its value. And here is the formula, and no one, however averse to mathematics, should be put off by it. P is equal to MV plus M prime B prime over T. P is prices. M is the quantity of ordinary money, or cash, in circulation. M prime is also money. It's that larger part which consists of bank deposits. V and V prime are the rates at which each of these two kinds of money are spent, their velocity of circulation. Prices go up as the amount of money, the M's, go up. The value of money, therefore, depends basically on its quantity. However, if money is quickly spent, the effect will be greater than if it lies buried in a mattress or a bank vault. So the quantity is multiplied by the rate of turnover, by the V's, or the velocity of circulation. And a particular increase in money supply will have more effect on prices if it is concentrated on a few transactions than if it is spread over a great many. So you then divide by the number of transactions, the T in the equation, to allow for the volume of trade. Let me repeat it once more. Prices will rise as the supply of circulating money and its velocity of circulation increase. And as the supply of bank deposits and their velocity of circulation increase. Then you divide by the volume of trade to eliminate the effect of any change in this. Fisher's equation of exchange as a statement of basic relationships still stands. It could quite possibly be as durable as pi r squared. For Fisher, however, the equation was no mere description of how things work. It was highly operational. By increasing or decreasing the supply of money, he concluded that you could increase or decrease prices. So by regulating the supply of money, you could regulate prices. And this Fisher proceeded to urge. In the 1930s, in the Great Depression years, prices were painfully, distressingly low. And so in 1933, in a very restricted form, Fisher's proposal was adopted. The gold content of the dollar was reduced. For the same gold, there could be more dollars, more money. It was hoped that prices would rise and that business and employment would also improve. It didn't, in fact, work, partly because the government kept most of the dollars in a special treasury fund. But Fisher's own formula showed how this and similar later efforts could be frustrated. For as money was created, people, 
and frighten people as they were in the years of the Depression, could simply hold on to the money. And in this way, falling velocity, falling Vs, could offset the increase in the quantity of money. Also, bank deposits, as we saw back in Amsterdam, increase only when the banks lend money. And in the 1930s, the banks were also very frightened. And they too froze up, did not land. Irving Fisher's great idea was that the supply of money would and should be controlled. The monetary system would no longer be a carnival ride made exciting by the accidents of gold discovery or non-discovery and by the wilder swings of pessimism and optimism of the bankers. Fisher showed how the supply of hard money could be increased by changing the gold content of the dollar and making the same amount of gold provide more money. What he could not ensure, especially during a depression, was that people would spend the money that was so created, or that the banks would do their share in money creation by making loans. This was the problem, having the government create the money and then ensure its expenditure, that John Maynard Keynes was to solve. It would be called the Keynesian Revolution. <laughs>